is I'll share with you this slide here. And I, I want to hit these items in red, just sort of real quick review, just because it's been a while since we've done this, and that'll kind of get us some momentum going. We'll focus in on the last two items, which would be this idea of internal versus external disputing. And what do we mean by that? And obviously, we'll go into that in more detail in the coming weeks. Uh, and the thing that we'll spend the most time on is really this idea of calling the credit bureaus after the results of investigation. I think this can be incredibly powerful. I want to share with you some sort of tips and strategies about that. And then uh, we'll not go beyond an hour on this. And so whatever extra time we'll have, we'll do for Q&A. And uh, certainly any comments you have, uh, put those in. Uh, I did see Miles said, please include NCTUE. That's the credit bureau on basically your utilities and cell phone bills and things like that. I'll just tell you, Miles, I have looked at, um, I don't know, probably three or four dozen of those credit reports. Uh, we just don't see many errors, at least in, in the clients that I have, uh, not saying that they don't exist and they certainly can after a bankruptcy, for example, but um, if there's any particular credit bureaus you want us to sort of focus in on, definitely let me know and we'll take a look at those. Over the last probably year, 18 months, we've done a pretty deep dive into places like Data X, which is uh, Equifax's subprime, uh, Factor Trust, that's TransUnion, Clarity, and we certainly will spend a lot of time on Clarity, that's Experian subprime. And then we have some of the more well-known ones, LexisNexis, Enovis, NCTUE, uh, but I'm always open to looking at additional ones. So let's go ahead and jump right into this. And so here's just a very quick overview of the four types of errors we see. So when we talk about, hey, there are errors, there are mistakes, there are things that are wrong with my credit report, what do we mean? Well, number one, as I have listed there, is inaccurate number two, incomplete, number three, just too old, and then number four, unverifiable. So what do we mean by these? Well, inaccurate is just flat out wrong. I mean, it could be I have a letter from Capital One saying, thank you for paying off your charged off debt in May of 22. And then in June of 22, they, they list a balance or they list 30 days, 60, 90, 120, 150, 180 charge off. It's kind of impossible, right? If I paid it off in May, it's impossible to be late in the month of June, to have a balance in the month of June, okay? So that's what I mean by inaccurate. Incomplete is, and we've done a lot of videos on these, we'll certainly hit on this a lot as we go through each credit bureau, but that's where you're looking through the payment history. There's just gaps in there, just information where it says NR, not reported, or ND, no data, or it's just completely blank. And that can be a very powerful method of finding the incomplete information and then disputing that. Another idea can be it's just too old. So we look at the date of first delinquency, and it can sometimes be more complicated than this, but let's just say it's seven years from the date of first delinquency. Date of first delinquency being the date we literally first went delinquent, never brought it current. Well, is it on our report eight years later, nine years later? Well, that's too old. So that can be an error. And then the idea of not being verifiable. So we do a dispute and let's say I dispute that Capital One example. And Equifax goes to Capital One and Capital One says, yes, he's right. He paid this off. He doesn't owe us anything as of May. And so June, he owes $2,000. Well, Equifax kind of go, you're giving us contradictory information. I mean, we just can't verify like what's correct, what's not correct. Well, they're supposed to delete it at that point. So that's the quick overview there. Let's talk about what an ACDV is. Because as we get into disputes, we see this terminology. So what is an ACDV? You can think of it like, just imagine that it, it's a physical folder here, a physical document. And at first, on the document, the credit bureau types up all the information about what are you disputing. Usually there's a place in there they put a little X or put a yes for image attached or document attached. And that's basically your dispute letter with the attachments. And 
this will, there should be an ACDV for each account that you dispute. And that ACDV goes to the furnisher, the data furnisher. And the data furnisher, somebody like Capital One or Bank of America or Midland or Portfolio Recovery. And then they get that and they're supposed to fill that out and say, well, here are the changes to be made or you should delete this account or verify it or update it. And then that goes back to the credit bureau. So again, if you sort of imagine this being, even though it's not a physical piece of paper, this ACDV being a physical piece of paper, well, how is that, how is that transferred back and forth? Well, it's done electronically through something called eOscar. And this is my very fancy graphics here. And you can see this is supposed to be like a roadway with little dots down the middle of it. And so the CRA, the credit bureau, gets that ACDV and they shoot it down the road to the furnisher. Then the furnisher gets it and they type in their response and then they shoot it back down the road. Well, the road is eOscar. There's nothing magical about eOscar. It's just the communication portal between the credit bureau and the data furnisher. They could use a fax, they could use email, they could use carrier pigeon. They just choose to use this thing called eOscar and we'll look into that in more detail. So then you get what are called results of investigation. And the idea here is, okay, you get this letter back from the credit bureaus, or it could be an email, whatever it is. And it says, all right, look, for every item you disputed, here's what happened. We are keeping it, so verifying it, we're updating it. So we're making some changes, but we're not getting rid of it. We're deleting it. In other words, here's what's happened. Supposedly, this is what they're supposed to do. Some of these bureaus are terrible about doing this, but they're supposed to go through item by item that you've disputed and say it's been deleted, it's been verified, in other words, no change, or it's been modified or updated. And then they tend to tell you what to do if you're not satisfied. They may give you a phone number, and we're going to talk about that in detail today. They may give you a website to go to. Hey, go here to pull your full report. Okay, we'll go do that. They may say, well, here's something else you can do if you're not satisfied with the results of investigation. So we want to make sure we're careful about that. All right. So here's the first of the two sort of new concepts that I want to talk about today. And this may look like chicken pox, right? But hopefully this will make sense. So we've got the credit report here and you see all the little red dots in that. Those are things that you can find within that credit report. So we'll call that the TransUnion credit report. We're not looking at anything else. We're just looking within that credit report and saying, hey, why do you say here's the date of last payment and the amount is zero? That doesn't make any sense. Or why do you say there's a high balance in May of 22 of $5,000, but when I look at the payment history, it says, the balance for May of 22 is $2,000. So we're just looking internally. The other option is to look externally. So externally would be things like identity theft or a mixed merge file where they've taken our file and mixed and merged it with somebody else. So we're taking outside information, it might be a police report, it might be an affidavit, FTC report. It might be a letter from Capital One saying, hey, thank you for paying this off in May of, 2022, you don't owe us anything else, but yet there's a balance in June and July and August. So we say, look at this outside letter. Now, sometimes people go, well, which one's best, internal or external? Well, it's whatever you have, okay? The advantage of internal is you're not asking the credit bureau to sort of pass judgment on any other document. You just say, hey, look, TransUnion, look at your own credit report. That's all I'm asking you to look for or to look at. You don't have to look at anything else, not even asking you to look at Equifax or Experian or this letter from Capital One. Just look at your own data and you can see the problems with it. Well, that has a certain appeal, right? Because I mean, it's their data. And it's kind of funny when they go, well, we can't be expected to have good data. Well, actually I do expect you to have good data, Mr. Credit Bureau. So. The downside of that is we're giving up an opportunity to provide them with some outside information. Now, it's kind of flip it. What about the external information? Well, the positive is there may be something very useful. Here's a court order. 
you know, Capital One sued me and judge entered judgment in my favor. Pretty important, right? And now if TransUnion decides to ignore that, which they're prone to do, that's their problem. They'll have to explain that to a judge. Okay. The sort of downside of this external information is, are you giving the credit bureau a chance to say, yeah, we, we didn't think that was reliable or we can't make heads or tails out of that. And so we want to be very careful. You know, if we give them that letter from Capital One, let's point out, hey, if you don't believe this is true, ask Capital One about this letter dated, you know, whatever, May 15, 2022. Or if you think I made up this court document, you go call the court. You send somebody down to the courthouse and pull the documents here. So if you don't believe me, you go investigate it, okay? So again, it's not really that one is better or worse than the other. It's whatever you have that can be the most persuasive to the credit bureau because you're trying to get something fixed. And then if they don't fix it and you've been very persuasive, then a judge is gonna look at that and say, guys, why did you not fix this? Why did you not delete this? And so I would always say, start with the internal and external. Now for most people, if we're putting aside like identity theft, mixed merge file, you're really looking internal, okay? We're just pointing out here the 74 internal inconsistencies or missing data. But if we have something external, then we certainly want to use that in the best possible way. So I'm gonna take a look here at our uh, comments. So Derek said, good to see you, glad you're feeling better. Hey, I appreciate it, Derek. It, uh, it was a little bit crazy there. So glad to be back kind of in the saddle here. Uh, let's see here. Um, all right, Merle asked about if you disputed errors with CRA and original creditor, what statute of limitation? So it's typically two years from when you get those results of investigation. It can be a little more complicated than that, but that's a good starting point is the thing. I did this dispute in basically two years to bring suit on that. Okay, so let's look at, this is the main thing I want us to talk about. And then again, kind of any remaining time, we'll go over any questions that, that you guys have. So let's talk about calling the credit bureau. So you get your results of investigation. You get that in the mail, or maybe it's an email. And it says, hey, we contacted the data furnisher they updated this, they verified it belongs to you. Uh, if you have any questions about this, call us at 1-800-blah-blah-blah. So why would we call them? Well, a couple reasons. One, if we don't call them and then we sue them, even though it's a bogus argument, they'll go, well, you should have called us. Now, as if calling them would you know, magically make them do the right thing when a certified mail letter did not. But let's take that argument away from them. Let's, let's give them a call, okay? Now, again, it's not always appropriate. Sometimes you've disputed multiple times or it's so clear your dispute, you're really just wasting your time calling them. But I, I would at least suggest that you consider calling the credit bureau. And so I wrote on the left-hand side and read persistence. It's the idea that, hey, you're showing that this is serious to you, it's important to you, and you are taking this very seriously and you are you know, staying on top of them. So you could do this with another dispute. You could do this with a phone call. Okay. Also wrote personal. So if you're a NBA fan or you watch the Michael Jordan series, you know, something would happen, right? The, the player on the other team breathed and I took that personal, right? Well, this makes it kind of personal because you are personally calling them, spending time, maybe 30 minutes on the phone with with Equifax and 30 minutes with TransUnion and Innovus and Clarity and all these companies. And so you're really investing time. And then when they don't do the right thing, if they choose to not do the right thing, somebody in a lawsuit can look at that and say, yeah, you know, I can see how spending 30 minutes on the phone with TransUnion being passed around from person to person, that would be very annoying. And I mean, I've even had lawyers that we've helped that they then call in and the person from the credit bureau will just absolutely misstate the law to them and go, look, there's nothing we can do. Absolutely nothing we can do. Our hands are tied. It's totally up to Capital One. We just do whatever they tell us. Well, that's very interesting to, to hear. 
Okay. You, sometimes you get the truth. Again, the truth is, hey, we don't really do an investigation. We just like contact, you know, the data furnisher and whatever they tell us to do, that's totally fine with us. You know, or you say, well, hey, should I dispute this again? Oh, it won't make any difference. We refuse to fix anything. Well, that's nice to have. Okay, we'll talk about, you know, recording those phone calls and things like that. Occasionally, though, you get like a real sincere, legitimate employee who really wants to fix things. And they look at this and they say, this is crazy. You know, you got sued. The judge threw the case out and you've got the court order. I see you sent us a court order. Yeah, this should come off your credit report. And they fix it. Great. Now, look, if they've already botched the investigation on the written dispute, just because they fix it over the phone, you can still sue them for that, okay? And so you you have a chance at getting it fixed. You also put yourself in a position where if you do have a case, often that case is more valuable. And this goes back a lot to that sort of personal aspect that you've taken time here. It's not just you sent a letter, although that's very impressive, a certified mail letter, but you spent 30 minutes on the phone and maybe you've had to explain your story twice or three times and they still are messing this up or they're lying to you about what the law is or lying to you about what your rights are. I mean, we've had them tell clients, they go, well, you have no right to dispute this debt. It's like, excuse me? Well, there, I, I point out, you know, 78 errors on here. Yeah, you're not allowed to dispute anything. Okay. See, very interesting in a recorded call, right? Because now the lawyer for the credit bureau is trying to explain to a judge, well, yeah, I mean, I know, I know our person said that and the supervisor refused to speak to him and, and, uh, and yeah, that's completely bogus, but Hey, you can't expect us to actually know what we're doing. Right. When you call us, I mean, we're only Equifax, Experian, TransUnion, Clarity, Innovus. I mean, we can't be expected to actually know anything. It's a pretty hard sell to make. Okay. So let's talk about, some tips here on calling and I'll, I, I didn't write this down, but let me just say this. You have to make your own decision about whether to record the call. I'll tell you what our suggestion is to our clients. If you call and they say, please be advised, all calls may be recorded. Sounds like they're saying that the call may be recorded, record it. Or if they say, Hey, this is Susie on a recorded line. Who'd I have the pleasure of speaking with? Sounds like they're agreeing that it be recorded and if our clients agree that it can be recorded then we're good now you have to know for your state and i'll just give you this sort of caveat like alabama is a two-party state so both parties have to agree to uh, let me rephrase that alabama is one party state so only one party but here's the problem you may be calling into a two-party state and so i like to make sure that both people agree so when you call and they say, please be advised, all calls may be recorded by you continuing to talk, you have agreed to that, okay? So the fact that they say it can be recorded and you and your mind say it can be recorded, I'm good with my clients doing this out. You know, if I don't represent you, obviously you have to make your own decision on this. Uh, some people like to tell the other side that it's being recorded. Totally up to you. Uh, I'll give you two ways to record. One is sort of the simple way call on your cell phone, put on speakerphone out loud, record on your laptop, your iPad, your, you know, Samsung tablet, whatever it is. The other way is you get an app. Okay. And let's see, there's a recent app that a client was telling me about. Let's see if I can find it real quick. I think it's called um, Cube ACR, something like that. I mean, it's all different versions. Whatever, I'd just say this, whatever app you get, if you're doing this, not just sort of on speakerphone, recording it, then test out that app first. Make sure you know how to use it. I mean, people will send us stuff and go, oh, it's an amazing hour long call. And it's just complete silence. I said, did you test it? Well, no, I didn't have time. Well, look, call your brother, your buddy, your sister, your mom, like, you know, record a two minute call, just test it out first, okay? And then what we have on the screen here is I would suggest having a script or a checklist. Now in our webinar series, you know, we'll provide that, but it can be as simple as you just have your letter that you sent. You should have a letter, copy of your letter you sent and just make some notes on there. Now, 
what I would suggest to you, at least for our clients, what we tell our clients is like any notes you make, anything you write down, that's evidence. Don't get rid of that. Okay. Keep that. But certainly nothing wrong with sort of highlighting things or circling things and saying, I want to make sure or just jot down, you know, like the, the next one I have on here is details of the dispute. So, hey, Equifax, did you get my letter dated, you know, January 15th, 2023? Well, yeah, yeah, we got that. OK, well, when did you get that letter? Now, you should have that from certified mail, but ask them just to make sure, because later on, if they claim we never got that letter, you got the recording where they admit they got it. It's kind of a problem for them. <coughs> Excuse me. So these details, when did you get it? You know, when did you send me the results of investigation? What's the date of that? Has there been any other results of investigation? Okay, just these sort of factual things. And then what happened in the dispute? They go, well, we investigated. Like, oh, I appreciate that, Susie. Tell me what you did for the investigation. Because this is where it can be very, very important. What if they say, well, we contacted Capital One and Citibank and Midland and Portfolio. Okay. And then in a lawsuit, those companies go, we never heard from Equifax. Well, that's weird. We got this recording where Equifax says that they contacted you. Now everybody's looking at Equifax. And now Equifax has to decide, do we give the proof we contacted them? Do we not? Like, what's going on? And so... You just want to know what happened, you know, when you contacted Capital One, what did they say? D did you send a copy of my letter? Okay, so I would be very nice. We're the good guys. Be very nice on the phone, but you can be nice and persistent. You can be nice and require that they answer your question. Or if they refuse to answer, say, why won't you answer? Now, this is not the place, you, you know, it's not a deposition. We're not saying, why do you take, you know, your CEO make this much money when you do lousy. I'm not talking about that sort of question. I'm talking about factual questions. What'd you do? Who'd you contact? What did they say back to you? Okay. Then what I always recommend is dispute again over the phone. So you got Susie or Bob or Ted or whoever it is on the phone. You say, look, I'd like to do another dispute on these same accounts. Now, sometimes they'll say, is it the same reason that you gave us in your, you know, seven page letter? Yes. They go, okay, fine. We'll run that back through. Perfect. Do you need anything else from me, Ted? Nope, no, nope, got everything I need. Where they may say, well, you're going to have to tell us the basis. Well, that's one reason to have your letter right there. You say, well, I'd like to dispute the Capital One account. It's account number 1234 opened on January the 5th, 2017. They go, okay, got that. What's your basis? Just read your letter. Because in your letter, you've identified the 73 errors. Now, if the person goes, I'm not going to sit here and listen to you read this, go, well, I'm sorry. I didn't know there was a time limit. I said I wanted to dispute this again. Can I tell you all the reasons why this Capital One account has errors? You know, if the person goes, no, which I've never had them do that, but if they go, no, I refuse to let you take my time up on this. Thing. Well, could you transfer me to a supervisor? So again, be nice. And look, what if they go, you know what? I'm sick of talking to you. I'm hanging up. They got explaining to do in front of a judge. See, when we sue them and they go, well, if you had only called us, we would have fixed it. Yeah, I did call and you hung up on me. And then the judge hears that recording and they're over there like, oh my goodness, how do we explain this? And so there's no bad outcome from this, okay? But have your letter there. And then this is something we always want is our complete full file disclosure, which is more than just your quote credit report. We always ask for that in letter. They will never give it to you, but ask them on the phone. Hey, why didn't you give me my full file disclosure? Now, sometimes they lie and say, we did. It's your credit report. You go, so my credit report is my full file disclosure. Absolutely. Okay. Can you send that to me again? Or if they go, well, no, we're not going to send that to you. Then ask them to send it to you. And they go, well, we're not going to send it to you. Well, why not? Okay. It, I, I do want to to caution you about one little thing here. They'll sometimes try and be clever. You go, I want my full file disclosure. They go, yes, ma'am, absolutely. We're going to send you your full, your full credit report. I go, well, I, I appreciate that, but I really want my full file disclosure. Sir, yes, we sent you your full credit report. You say, well, is my credit report the same thing as my file disclosure? 
and again, they'll try and be clever and, and maybe not lie, but really be deceptive. And they'll go, yes, you received your full credit report, sir. Okay, is that the same thing as my full file disclosure? Do you want me to send your credit report again? You know, and so you don't have to ask them 27 times, but it'll be clear that they're being very sort of cagey and dodgy here on this, which is a problem for them because you have the right to your full file disclosure. So that's really what I had prepared for you guys. I'm going to go through the questions here and I'll take a sip of water here so I can hopefully uh, make it the rest of the time here. But uh, definitely any you know questions you guys have, uh, hopefully related to credit reporting but if there's something else you know feel free to ask that as well and uh as long as we have questions we'll go to about uh two o'clock central time here okay so i see one question is tried to enroll in the boost program from experian but none of the dozen or so accounts i entered was accepted by them for some reason so I i'll be very candid. I'm not that familiar with the boost program. I think that's when you report like a utility bill or a Netflix or something like that. So I don't know exactly how that works in terms of, um, you know, what they accept, what they don't accept, but, um, you might just call them and ask them, say, Hey, why weren't these accepted and, and see what they say to you. All right, uh, let's see. Alice says, Xfinity is using my Amex account after my account is closed. Should I file a police report? So I, I guess I would ask what you mean by uh, the account closing. So your Xfinity, which should be like a cable or uh, internet provider. Are you saying the Xfinity account closed you're done with that but yet they're still charging your amex or your amex account is closed and xfinity still hitting that i i would only file a police report if there's some fraud going on um so maybe give me a little bit more information on that okay diana has a great question here and it's funny because there were um several of us from around the country talking about this very issue yesterday and that is you send Experian, it could be any bureau, but Experian seems notoriously bad about this. You send them disputes, certified mail, return receipt, so they fill it out, either the physical green card or electronically signed, and you get no responses. So what I would do is I would call them, okay? Use this, you know, kind of these tips that we have here on the screen, call Experian and say, guys, I'm really confused because I sent you two disputes. I never got results of investigation back. So can you look and tell me, did you get my dispute? Let's start with the first one. That was dated November 15. Uh, the Postal Service shows that you guys signed for it on November 21st. Do you show receiving that? And, you know, if they get kind of squarely, well, you know, it's going to take us a minute to look through here and, and I don't want to keep you waiting. I know this is, you know, I don't want to waste your time. Go, no, 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 no. I'm totally good. I got all day. Let's see. You know, take your time, Mr. Experian, and let me know, did you get my first dispute? When did you get it? Okay. So we're just kind of at that point getting the facts. Okay. So Diana, we're, we're, we're saying, did you get my letter? When did you get it? Did you do an investigation? What did you do for the investigation? Did you send me results of investigation? When did you send those? Hey, I never got them. Can you send those to me? Can you email them to me? Can you put them in the mail again? You know, what's going on? Now, when you don't hear from the credit bureaus, or actually even when you do, my policy and my firm is we always want a new set of credit reports, okay? Because maybe they told us they uh, deleted an account, but then they really didn't. Or maybe they said they verified it, but actually they deleted it. Okay, and I would certainly want to see that with Experian. Uh, but I, I would just suggest calling them. And if they go, oh, well, your letter was deemed frivolous or suspicious. So what does that mean? Well, there was something about your letter just wasn't right. Well, I understand that, but tell me specifically what was it? And that's when sometimes they get real squirrely. They're like, well, just there were indications that it didn't come from you. 
Well, what indications? Okay. And hey, I don't remember getting a letter telling me it was frivolous. Did you mail me a letter? And see, again, we want to pin them down, be very precise on details. Like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. We, we sent you that letter. What's the date of the letter? Well, I can't quite tell. Well, when did you mail the letter to me? This, you know, frivolous, suspicious letter. And well, I, I can't quite tell that. It's going to take me probably 10 minutes to figure that out. Take your time, Bob. I got all day. All right. So we want to really press them on these details. Experian is sort of notorious, although they all have done it. But Experian is notorious for at least the allegation being made against them. I think it's pretty solid evidence that they sometimes will just take thousands, sometimes tens of thousands of letters. Just toss them, throw them away. Now, you'd think they'd be smart enough not to do that on certified mail, but we have it happen where we get no response from them and think, well, why would they not respond? I mean, Equifax responds, TransUnion responds. Why is Experian not responding? So I would try the phone call method and see, did they get them? Did they investigate them? What were the results of the investigation? They fix the account, they delete it, what they do. And then you may want to follow it up with a third dispute letter. But also you can, you know, tell them you want to dispute right then over the phone. Okay. So keep me posted on that. I'm very curious what will happen. Okay. So see, Laura has a question relates to past webinar. First and second lawsuit were filed. It was dismissed without prejudice. Uh, since both lawsuits were dismissed without prejudice, do they contact the credit attorney and try to get it resolved? What's the best way to resolve it? Well, so uh, Laura, this will sound um, repetitive if you've watched other things where if you're dealing with lawsuits, I would get with a consumer lawyer in your state, okay? Because it could mean that they have no right to refile the lawsuit, or maybe they do have the right to refile the lawsuit. But um, you know, you can always contact the creditor's attorney. Now the creditor attorney, let's say this is Midland, for example, the Midland lawyer may still have the account or they may have given it back to Midland. You don't know. So you can always call, you can contact Midland or portfolio or whoever and try to work it out. But I would want to know kind of wh where I stand first. Okay. And I'll give you just a couple quick pointers. If you were sued and you answered the lawsuit, denying that you owe the money, well, that's a dispute. And under the FDCPA, Section 1692E8, the debt collector has to mark your account as being disputed. Now, I'm talking about a debt collector here, not like Capital One or Citibank or something like that. So it may be that they have violated the law and you can end up suing them. So... That may make it all go away. They may pay you money. In other words, you may not have to pay them money. Uh, I would also be careful about what statute of limitation. If you call them and let's say you agree to make some token payment of $10, does that restart statute of limitation? Most states, I would say the creditors claim the answer is yes. All I can tell you is Alabama. It's a little more complicated than that. You have to do a little bit more than that, but that's the argument that they'll make. So you want to be very careful if you're calling to resolve it. Are you running the risk if you make a payment of restarting that statute of limitation, and then getting sued again? So we just be very careful about doing that. Okay, so here's uh, J.D. Lewis. Do the CRAs or the furnishers violate any laws when they do not mark an account as dispute after an account is disputed directly with credit bureaus? So uh, we do have the, the part of the law I was just talking about. So let me pull this up. Share my screen here. Okay, so, all right, so this is section 1692E, if we go down to E8 here, let me try to make it a little bit bigger so you can see it. So this is only about debt collectors. So communicating or threatening to communicate to any person credit information, that would include credit bureaus, which is known or should be known to be false, including failure 
to communicate the disputed debt is actually disputed. So that is one uh, sort of piece of this, okay? Now, the FCRA also has a provision. I'll say this, there's a few more requirements under the FCRA. So under the FDCPA, the, the collector just has to know that the account's disputed. They might learn that from the creditor or from a credit bureau or from the mailman or whoever. With the FCRA, you really got to tell directly, and it needs to be what's typically called a bona fide type of dispute. In other words, with the FDCPA, that section we just looked at, we can just say, I dispute the debt. You don't have to give them any basis. The FCRA, there needs to be a basis for it. And so kind of the classic example, and this is from a great lawyer in Virginia, Lynn Bennett, it's called the Saunders versus BB&T case. Guy gets a car loan. This is how I remember the facts. Gets a car loan, and it's back when you have a payment book, and they don't give him the payment book. He says, well, I want to make my first payment. They go, whoa, whoa, whoa. You got to wait till you get the payment book. No payment book. He tries to pay like three or four times. They keep telling him no, and finally they give him the payment book and go, oh, by the way, you're three months behind. Well, he disputes that. Now, you could argue, well, technically he was behind because he didn't pay, but he certainly tried to pay. And so it would be deceptive to not mark that as disputed. And so Lynn Bennett got, I want to say, uh, maybe an eighty, ninety thousand dollars $90,000 verdict on that. And it was upheld by the appellate court. So that would be an example. So uh, JD, on as far as these disputes, I would say, what's the basis of the dispute? In other words, if we say, well, um, you know, I saw some comment on my YouTube recently. I mean, we get these from time to time. People say, well, corporations have no right to make loans. And really the consumer is a creditor. And we went off the gold standard and admiralty law. No, that not that kind of junk. Okay. Judge is not going to accept that. But a legitimate, you know, arguable reason here, you know, um, I, here's an example. It's surprising how often this happens. You go to close on your house or you trade in your car and the the new owner of the house, you know, has obviously paid the money to pay off the loan or the dealership says, yep, you know, you get a $5,000 credit on this and we'll pay off your loan. In other words, you've done everything you're supposed to and the title agent or the car dealer, for whatever reason, they don't pay off your loan. Well, arguably you're late, but it's a very legitimate basis for being late and it should be marked as disputed. So uh, it certainly is worth exploring that. And you'll find this section under section 1681 S2A or B that's dealing with the furniture. And that's typically where you'll find that. Uh, but check out that Saunders case. I think if you go to my YouTube channel, um, I did a long video on it, maybe I don't know, a year or two ago and a pretty important case. All right, let's see here. DeMarcus says, why is it when you have a dispute sent to CRAs with attorney letterhead, they act on it faster than when we as consumers send in regular disputes? So um, you sometimes get better results. Sometimes you get worse results. Okay, so let, let me give you kind of both sides of this. On the one hand, the credit bureaus go, oh my goodness, it's from a law firm. We got to treat this more seriously. They all have sort of a VIP a team where if it's an athlete, celebrity, politician, judge, sometimes lawyer, sending stuff in, that gets sort of pulled away from the normal team that's going to like not do really anything. And they're going to look at it a little more carefully because they, they really don't want to annoy a senator or Brad Pitt or Kim Kardashian, right? And so in that sense, it could get you where uh, you have somebody a little more experienced looking at it who might remotely take the law seriously. On the other hand, they also look at these, go, oh, that's just credit pair play. That's just credit pair law firm. So we're going to ignore it. So I'll just tell you, you know, it's very rare that we send letters on our letterhead. And uh, my view is if the letter's good, it's solid, it identifies all the errors, it shouldn't require a lawyer's name on there. Like my client is perfectly sufficient to have their name on the letter, send that out, and either it gets fixed or it doesn't get fixed. If it doesn't get fixed, then we look at suing. So 
DeMarcus, like I said, sometimes it does help and sometimes it actually hurts where they look at this, say, oh, well, that's like, you know, Lexington Law or some credit repair place, and we're going to ignore that. All right, let's see. Uh, oh, I see. Diana says uh, App Otter. So I think what um, Dan's mentioning there is there's a great app. I mean, I use it every single day. It's called Otter AI. I know it's for the iPhone. There's a web-based version. I assume there's an Android version. And it's something <clears throat> you can use like in a meeting. And let, let's say there's three of us sitting around a table and we're having a half-day meeting. It'll like transcribe it all automatically. And it tends to recognize, oh, this is speaker one, speaker two, speaker three. And also you can go to it and sort of double click on any of the transcript and it'll pop up the the voice recording at that point. So it's great. Also use it for yourself. You know, if you have ideas you want to sort of capture. Uh, so that's certainly a great way to do it. Um, at least to my knowledge, you can't be on the phone and have Otter recording at the same time. Uh, but if you have like a tablet over here with Otter and then you're on your speaker phone, that certainly could work. Uh, let's see, Derek said, can we call for a third party using power of attorney? You know, you may be able to. I would just make sure that it's disclosed what you're doing, okay? And, um, you know, if you send in that power of attorney and you have the right to to communicate with the credit bureau, then, you, yeah, you may want to do it that way. Uh, from a lawsuit standpoint, I would much rather have the consumer do it, okay? Because go back to what I mentioned about kind of the Michael Jordan, you know, and then I took it personally. You know, it's one thing to say, well, I have my credit repair place with power of attorney and they spent 30 minutes on the phone. That was very frustrating versus I spent 30 minutes on the phone and, you know, I got transferred to three different people and, you know, they, nobody seemed to know what was going on. Nobody would give me an answer just from an emotional distress damages standpoint. Those are two fundamentally different things, but uh, not to say that you can't call with power of attorney, assuming it gives you that power, but um, to keep in mind, my perspective is a lawsuit being filed, standing in front of a federal judge. I would much rather have my consumer have made that call rather than somebody else making that call. All right, let's see. Murley says, filed a combined lawsuit in federal court against Amex. And uh, some FDCPA violation against debt collectors. Credit card defaulted for eight thousand. Uh, lawyer reached out settlement. Do my damages exceed more than eight for my situation? How would you handle this? So, oh, I, I think I see the credit card that you were maybe sued on originally was eight thousand um, dollars. So. First of all, it's hard for me to say, you know, here's what the, the case is worth. I'll say this, that I think if you have legitimate claims, those claims should be worth more than $8,000, okay? With Amex, typically there's an arbitration provision, and so you could file arbitration, and normally you have the option to go to JAMS under Amex, and JAMS, they may drop five, ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 if you do an in-person in other words, not like what some people call a document review where you're just sending a bunch of papers and I would never do a document review arbitration. I would always want a live hearing. You know, it could be by Zoom. It could be in person. I don't care so much about that. But my point is that I think they would be smart if you have legitimate claims to, uh, you know, make those go away and to make the debt go away and to put some money in your pocket. Uh, I, I would try and get a lawyer. I'm trying to remember Murley. I think you're in uh, Illinois. I, I try to get a lawyer there. Um, actually, I know somebody that I would think I could recommend to you. So just email me, Murley, and I'll find that lawyer's name and number. And I would at least give them a call, see if they could help you. All right. Um, <coughs> Bruno asks, What's the difference between full file disclosure? So great question. Let me share my screen here. So let's look at 
1681G. Now, sometimes this is also section 609, which confuses people because there's like this 609 letter, which is really just a bunch of garbage. But there is something legitimate here. And so we have information on file. So every CRA, upon request, clearly and accurately disclosed to the consumer, you know, all information in the consumer's file at the time of the request, except that, and then there are some exceptions here, okay? If we want to know, well, what does a file mean? So this is, well, it, that's correct, but let me show this to you kind of in context. So it's one reason why this Cornell Law School is great. If you go here to section 1681A, definitions, and then we should be able to find file in here so yeah this so it's just sort of a coincidence it's 1681 g is the file disclosure then when you go to 1681 a the subpart is actually ironically g for file so term file when it's used in connection with information on any consumer means all of the information on that consumer recorded retained by a cra regardless of how the information is stored so you know, that would be, for example, if you want to think about, do they have the data first delinquency? Well, Equifax has that. Clarity has that. They give it to you. Does Innovus give it to you? No. Does Experian give it to you? No. Does TransUnion give it to you? No. But they got it. So if they have it, and that's part of the information they have on me, why don't they disclose it? Now, they've got arguments. I think they're bogus. They've got arguments why. But the, the starting point is, let's get our full file disclosure. Now, I don't think you need that to do a dispute. Just go to annualcreditreport.com, pull your real reports. You can find all the errors you need to dispute, but then ask for that full file disclosure. Because what we'll see is they might start removing some information or, you know, in your dispute, you say, give me the data first delinquency, TransUnion experience. They won't give that to you. Well, now you do need your full file disclosure to be able to see, are they even doing this right? So I would always ask for it. Hopefully that is uh, helpful to you there. All right. Uh, let's see. Alice mentions Xfinity is closed, um, but yet I, it sounded like they're still hitting your credit card. So I would call them. And again, you know, you, you make this choice, but if they say all calls may be recorded, you know, record the call. Like, why are you guys... My account's closed. Why are you hitting my credit card? I would want to know the explanation for that. See, George says, you have to let them know you're recording them. So everybody has to make that decision. I'll just tell you, in my view, when they announce to you that this is true for my clients, okay? And, you know, I don't represent you unless I do and don't realize it. Uh, but for my clients, what I tell them is if the person on the other phone says, please be advised, all calls may be recorded. Well, you continuing to stay on that call, that gives your consent, okay? And that's certainly the position every one of these credit bureaus would take. So all we're doing is saying, fine, I'm going to record it too. Now, I don't think you have to tell them because they've already told you it's being recorded. It's sort of like if I call you, George, and I get your voicemail and you say, hey, please leave a recording at the beep on my voicemail. Well, I know it's being recorded, okay? And... So I don't have to, you know, have you tell me again, it's being recorded. It's like by me leaving the message, I'm recording it by them saying, Hey, all calls may be recorded or, Hey, this is a recorded line. They agree to it. I agree to it. I'm comfortable with that. But again, everybody has to make their own decision on that. All right, let's see. JD Lewis called Experian while recording them, asked them for my full file disclosure. Rep said the full file disclosure is the same as my credit report. Yeah. A lot of times they will say that. Ask her, she's sure. Then she asks, what do I mean by full file disclosure? How do I use that information to my advantage? You know, you may just request it again in writing and say, look, I called your person. I spoke with Bob, you know, on whatever, December 21st at 2.33 p.m. Central Time. And Bob said, my credit report is my full file disclosure. I'm confused because here's what full file disclosure is. Are you saying all the information you have on me? I mean, like all means all. All of that's in my credit report. Like I'm confused about that. And so 
Uh, that's the way that I would use it. Then ultimately in a lawsuit, you know, and I'm not saying I would never bring just a file disclosure lawsuit, but normally it's connected with they did a lousy investigation. They're not doing maximum possible accuracy and all that gets put in together. Okay. So Tanya says, so calling does not extend time they can take to respond. I was under assumption it could add an extra 15 days. So it can, okay. Anytime we give new information to the credit bureau that can extend the time for them to respond. But what I'm talking about when I say calling them is after the results of investigation are in. So the investigation is closed. Call them. What'd you do? Who'd you contact? And then I like to do another dispute right then. And that would give them another 30 days. Okay. But I think it's worth it to get that recording, to have that personal sort of involvement with it. And, and again, sometimes they'll just tell you like the truth. I mean, now the, my view is I get rid of the people who tell the truth, but you know, when the person goes, look, all we're going to do is whatever Capital One tells us. We are not doing our own investigation. That's how it works here. Okay, that's very useful to know in a lawsuit. So yeah, it does extend the time or give them a new set of 30 days, but uh, you have to be comfortable with that. But I think overall it's worth it. Let's see, Jessica, sent Midland settlement offer for an alleged debt, wrote settlement terms, removal of this account from my credit report, account settles in full on the back, they endorsed it, the check was written out to the original creditors, is this illegal? So I'll say this, you have to look at your state law and the, the terms and conditions of the credit card agreement. A lot of times they say none of that stuff matters, like you agree, you can't write anything on the back of it, it's meaningless. I'll say this, that most judges I know would not care what's written on there. Um, it's going to, uh, uh, it's like a mailbox or a, a drop box, not like drop box we have on our computer, but just like th that's being sent to some place and there's just a bunch of people in there like ripping open envelopes and like running them through. They're not really looking carefully at the, whose name is on it. Uh, and certainly not what's on the back of it. So you have to check out your particular law and look at your terms and conditions for the contract that was uh, in effect while your agreement was in effect and see, does it talk about this? All right, so can you sue a furniture under six, section 1681 S2B if you only disputed with the CRAs? Yeah, so actually that's the only time you can sue a furniture under the FCRA for this type of uh, claim, a uh, lousy investigation, is you have to go directly to the credit bureaus. And then the credit bureaus, remember that ACDV and eOscar, then they reach out to the furniture. Now, if you just go directly to the furniture, you can't sue under the FCRA. Now, California has its own version. We're not talking about that. Um, and you also asked about e8 well under e8 uh you don't have to go to the credit bureaus you can you don't have to it's just literally does the debt collector have reason to know that this account's disputed could be you know they saw a banner behind a plane flying over their corporate headquarters like what, what however they get the information if they know that you dispute this they have to mark it as disputed all right. Uh, let's see. Delby wrote the um, Google Scholar for Saunders versus bb &T. Let me just pull this up real quick. And so thank you for doing that, Delby. So, uh, yeah, this should be popping up. So Saunders versus bb &T. Um, No, actually, this is a different one. That This is too recent, 2020. Um, yeah, this is something else here. So let me just see if I can pull that up here. So this is going to be it, I think 2008. And, uh, let's see. Yeah, this is Lynn Bennett, 
uh, from Virginia. So this is actually the one. Let me drop this into the message thing here. Uh, those others may be something similar. I just I, I knew the timing of this. Um, yeah, it's yeah, it's about right. About 14, 15 years ago. So we got a thousand statutory damages, eighty thousand in punitive, and they affirm it. So check that out. Or I think um, yeah, if you just go to my YouTube channel, I think you can also find it there. All right. So let me wrap this up real quick here. Um, J.D. Lewis, would a duplicate account or incomplete account be considered sufficient reason to sue? So I'll say this, if it's if it's inaccurate. Now, sometimes there are duplicate accounts, but they're accurate. It might be like, here's the account, and then it was closed out, then another account was open, then another account was open. So just because there's like three mortgage accounts, you know, it, depending on how they're worded, they may still be accurate. As far as incomplete, you know, we're looking at all the pieces of errors, all the inaccuracies, all the incompleteness. And then we look at that and make a judgment call. Is that enough to sue on? So I can't just tell you like, you know, one piece is enough. It may be. I like to, I think the last time I, I wrote one of these in a lawsuit, you know, we talked about the over 127 errors on the Capital One account. Well, that's nice to write for the judge. Okay. All right, see, Alice, uh, disputes filed with Amex. Let them know, not a customer of Xfinity. Charges were removed. Another charge. Uh, da, 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 da. My account's been hijacked. I mean, I, I what I would do with that is I'd write a certified mail letter to Amex, to Xfinity, and just explain all this. I'd follow it up with some calls and... Uh, you may need to get with a lawyer in your state under the Fair Credit Billing Act, FCBA, that can help you with Amex. See, George says, uh, collection company received a letter requesting payment. This account was just bought. Sent a letter to Q Resurgent. I, I'm familiar with Resurgent. I'm not sure Q Resurgent. For validation, haven't verified after six days. Just sent a letter to verify the account. Uh, to the credit bureaus. So keep this in mind on validation. And this is under section 1681 um, G for the, I'm sorry, 1692 uh, G. Validation, if you send it within the time period that you're allowed to request this with sort of your full rights under section G, then the debt collector can do nothing at all. They don't have to respond. They just can't collect on it. Or they could respond and say, now we're going to collect again. Or they could say, you know what? We're closing our account. There's no time limit. They could take six years to respond. They just can't collect in the meantime. So the fact that they don't respond to that doesn't obligate the credit bureaus to get this off your credit report. So those are two different laws, kind of two different battles going on there. What I would do is look on the credit bureaus at the errors on that account, that resurgent account or whatever account it is, look for the errors, look for things that are inaccurate, look for things that are incomplete. And that's how I would dispute it. Uh, let's see. Uh, Kim asked, can you hear this broadcast again? Yeah. I, so we've been going about an hour. Uh, when we stop this, I think it takes about that long to sort of process. It's all done automatically. And then it shits in an email out to everybody that's registered for this. So you should get that, Kim. Uh, let's see. J.D. Lewis, what section of the FCRA do the CRAs violate when they fail to send you notice of reinvestigation results? Can you sue for that? So let's look at that. So this will be under 1681I. So this is when they call it reinvestigation. Theoretically, everything's investigated before it's allowed on your report. That's kind of a big assumption. So it's called reinvestigation. And so when you do that, uh, so here's an extension, additional 15 time, or 15 days if there's additional information. Um, they have to give notice to the furnisher of information. And then 
they can decide this is frivolous, but they have to tell you that within five business days. Okay. And then, uh, I mean, this is worth reading all of this and what they have to do is respond to you within that time period. And now keep in mind, they could arguably mail you something and you never get it. So just because we don't get it doesn't mean they didn't investigate. That's why it's nice to follow up with the phone call. And uh, as far as would we sue for that? Yeah, if they don't do an investigation, that's a lousy investigation. That's, you know, a great lawsuit in my view, assuming you identified real errors. If you didn't identify real errors, it doesn't really matter. But if you identified real errors, they don't properly investigate or they don't investigate at all. Yeah, that's a good lawsuit. Let's see. Uh, Merle, you mentioned lawyer in Illinois. I'll have to look up his name and number. If you'll just email me, I'll get with you on that. Uh, Alice, I'm in Georgia. Okay. And uh, Steve Koval is a great lawyer in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, John says in single party state allows me to record them Ar arguably, but if you're calling into a two party state, that two party state may say their laws apply. So my simple rule is if they say the call can be recorded, my clients record it. If they don't just make good notes about what's going on. Uh, let's see here. Ryan asking a complaint. Would you put specific examples of mistakes that were not fixed? Uh, yeah, we, we tend to do that, um, sort of sometimes initially we keep it a little more uh, general cause we file everything in state court, then it gets removed to federal court. Sometimes they want more detail and we sort of, uh, if you remember the story from the Bible, Moses leads the children of Israel out and they ask for, uh, meat, you know, they're getting manna, like really, you know, food from heaven, right? They're like, no, 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 we want meat. And, and kind of the response from God is, you want meat? I'll give you meat. I'll give you so much meat. It'll come out of your nose and your ears and everything. Else. That's sort of what we do with information. When the bureaus say, well, we, we want more detail, you know, explain exactly what we did wrong. We're like, you sure you want this? Because we'll give you a 50-page lawsuit and we'll give you every single detail of what's wrong. Usually after they get that, they're like, yeah, we didn't want that much information. And so uh, you can go ahead and give them all that. Or, you know, you may want to like attach your letter, just redact parts of it and attach that to a lawsuit. Or, you know, there, there's different strategies there. And I kind of do it all different ways. Uh, let's see. Can you arbitrate with a dealer for misleading practice? If there's an arbitration agreement, whether it's with a credit card, cell phone company, auto dealership, you know, you, you have an account with Experian where you pay them money and now you've agreed to arbitrate with them. Like whatever it is, we just look for, is there an arbitration agreement? Uh, Jessica, how can you verify if a debt collector or debt buyer has a right to collect in my state, Texas? So I, I would ask Texas consumer lawyer, there may be some requirement like what's it called there? I think it's a Texas finance code or something like that, but there may be like a licensure board for collectors that they, they have to be licensed for them to qualify to collect. Um, just be real precise about it. Like there's a, Give you an example. There's a, a law, it's called the door closing statute in Alabama. It says if you're not registered to do business, you can't, uh, the doors to the, the courts are closed. Well, let's say we got a debt collector that's not registered, but yet they're suing us in Alabama. Seems pretty slam dunk, right? Except you got to find the cases that say, well, actually this doesn't apply when interstate commerce is involved. And so that basically guts it. All right. So uh, I, I'm just saying it, it's fine to do your own research, but either be really thorough with it or give it the lawyer in your state. Uh, Merley says under diversity rule and federal question, would your law firm take the FCRA lawsuit uh, adding in violation file in Alabama? So it, it, it's a great question. And we can file a case in Alabama, for example, but the other side may argue that uh, that personal jurisdiction is in question and it would be better to transfer the case to 
you know, Atlanta for Equifax or Illinois for TransUnion. Uh, I, my suggestion would be stay in your own state, get a lawyer there to file it. And, uh, and like I said, I'll, I'll email you somebody. Uh, let's see. What does it mean? Not specify on CRA dispute. This is from Diana. What does it mean? Not specify on CRA dispute results. So I'm not sure I completely understand that. Um, I may have put on my PowerPoint slide that, you know, we want them to give us very specific details about, or each specific item. So if I dispute an address, either it's kept or it's deleted. I dispute the credit limit in May, 2022. I need to know what are they doing? Have they updated that? Have they deleted the account? What are they doing here? Let's see, J.D. Lewis, um, old address employer, two accounts were removed after a few rounds, but a month later reappeared. They not notify me uh, what law they violate. Can I so look in that section 1681I, you'll see all about reinsertion. So they're supposed to notify you. Now, again, just because you don't get it doesn't mean they didn't send it. It's pretty good evidence they didn't send it. But again, you may want to call them and say, hey, why did you reinsert this information? Did you send me notice? Explain why you reinserted it. See what they say. Um, Jessica asked about a lawyer in Texas. Uh, there's a couple. There's a guy in San Antonio, Bill Clanton. Not Bill Clinton, but Clanton with an A. Uh, there's a James Foley in Fort Worth. Um, there's others. You can look on the NACA website, National Association of Consumer Advocates. And uh, let's see. JD says you offer complaint review service for pro se. Um, no, the answer is really no. We, I mean, I, I'm a practicing attorney. You know, we file our own lawsuits. And so we don't really do that. Um, frankly, it's rare if a lawyer comes to me, and says, hey, can you review this? Because what it typically involves, they say, well, hey, just, just take you like five minutes. Just, just take a look at this. See, I got to see the, the underlying data. You know, how do I know if this is a valid S2B claim unless I know, did you dispute it through the credit bureaus? Did the credit bureaus notify the data furnisher? And so it kind of grows into this, you know, kind of big thing. So uh, what I would recommend is don't ever bring these pro se because just really no reason. You get a free lawyer, you know, lawyer will be paid by the other side. and so it'd sort of be like, hey, we're in a gun battle and I'm going to leave my gun at home and just take a knife. I, you know, not saying you can't win, but why, why restrict yourself from something that could be so helpful? So I would get with a lawyer. And sometimes I'm not saying you, but sometimes people don't bring a lawyer in because they've gone to several lawyers and lawyers are like, look, you don't have a case. And they get mad and go, oh, you don't know what you're talking about. Well, if you're talking to a lawyer that this is what he or she does for a living is sue the credit bureaus, it would seem unlikely that they would be so dumb as to turn down a good case. And so it had to make you wonder, maybe I'm missing something. Okay. So if I go to, you know, Dr. James Andrews, who's, you know, world renowned working on athletes on certain orthopedic injuries, and I say, hey, can you fix this? He goes, no, you don't need surgery. I go, you're an idiot. You don't know what you're talking about. Well, it's possible, but it's probable since this is what he does for a living, that if he's telling me I don't need surgery, I don't need surgery. And you can always get a second opinion. So I would just recommend, you know, try to get with a lawyer in your state that does this type of work. So, um, okay, this will be the last one. Anthony asked, live in Florida. Um, yeah, get with me. You know, Florida's a big state, so uh, there's some guys in the Tampa area, guys in Miami, guys in the Panhandle. So uh, just shoot me an email. Let me know what part of state you're in and what your issue is, and uh, I should know some guys for you. Okay, guys, have a good one, and if y'all want to, be back next week, and we'll start our series on, you know, kind of at the the foundational level. How do we identify the errors? How do we dispute things and then we'll go kind of week by week through particular credit bureaus so looking forward to that and you guys have a great one all right bye-bye